In our next lesson on protein function from Chapter 5, we want to look at intermediate filaments. These are exclusively structural proteins, that is, the structures are very static, unlike the microfilaments and microtubules we saw in our previous videos that were very dynamic. The first we'll look at is keratin. The basic unit is a dimer of coiled alpha helices. In other words, each monomer is an alpha helix, and we wrap them around each other to form what's called a coiled coil. And you can see that on the far right of your screen here. Each of those alpha helices is either in blue or green. An interesting thing about the primary structure is that there's a repeat of seven similar residues throughout the length of the chain. And the first and fourth residues are nonpolar. So if we look down the helical axis, and that's pictured at the bottom of the screen here, because of the size of that helix and the position of those nonpolar residues, the first and fourth nonpolar residues are on one side of that helix. So then when we form our dimer, the, the nonpolar residues on one chain will interact with those of the other. Note that since these are nonpolar residues, we're talking about hydrophobic van der Waals interactions. So here's a really good example of how an intermolecular bond that by itself is weak can produce a very strong, very sturdy structure when you zip up several of those together. It's also a good example of the lesson of how the primary structure drives the association of the secondary and, in this case, quaternary structure. Now keratin can also form more complex structures, and that's illustrated on the top right of your screen here. Two monomers may associate in a coiled coil arrangement to form a dimer. Two dimers can then associate to form a tetramer, and two tetramers combine to form an octamer, and so forth, until we get to the largest, most complex form of keratin, an intermediate filament. This may contain as many as 16 to 32 separate polypeptide chains. You can think of the structure as if we took several strands of material and combined them into multiple cords to form a very strong rope. The more strands we have, the stronger the rope. Keratin is a protein that is a part of nails, hair, and skin, though there are different forms of this protein in different cell types. For instance, alpha keratin is present in hair, and beta keratin is a component of nails. It's not important for our purposes that you distinguish between the different types, only that you know they exist. Another feature of keratin that contributes to its strength is the presence of strong covalent disulfide bonds. As the number of disulfide bonds increases, the strength of the structure likewise increases and its flexibility decreases. For instance, the keratin in nails contains a greater number of disulfide bonds than hair. Nails are consequently stronger and less flexible than hair. At the bottom right of your screen here is an electron micrograph of a layer of skin cells. The upper layer of dead epidermal cells is composed almost entirely of keratin. The next intermediate filament we want to look at is collagen, and we'll see it's different not only in its primary structure, but also its quaternary structure. It's a trimer. It's a part of animal bones and tendons, so again, a very strong structure. It holds our cells together. In fact, the word collagen comes from the French meaning glue, so it essentially glues our cells together. It's a part of our connective tissue. It supports our body's weight and it keeps our organs from bumping into each other when we run. It is the most abundant protein in most vertebrates. In this case, an interesting thing about the primary structure is that every third residue is glycine. So that must be important, and indeed it is. 30% of the rest of the residues are either proline or hydroxyproline and you can see those structures at the top of the screen here. Here's the familiar structure of proline, and we can add a hydroxyl group to that number 2 carbon, and that makes it hydroxyproline. The most common primary structure within collagen is a triplet of glycine, proline, and hydroxyproline, and you can see that in the stick model in part A of our figure. Can you see that glycine in gray, the familiar proline ring in yellow, and here's the hydroxyproline in red with that hydroxyl group hanging off the ring. 
it forms a narrow left-handed helix and you can see that a little bit better in the space fiddling model in part B. As you can see a very narrow helix as if we took a regular alpha helix and stretched it out. Now each of these separate polypeptide chains will associate to form a triple helix. It's a right-handed triple helix. So here in part A in the figure at the bottom right is our coiled coil, or that is to say our alpha helix. Part A here you can see the ribbon diagram here and here's the space filling model here. Those three strands will associate three-dimensional space to form this right-handed triple helix and that's pictured in part C here. If we look down the helical axis, that's part D at the top of the screen here, the glycine residues are pictured in red and we can see that no other residue would fit. Remember glycine doesn't really have a side chain, it just has a hydrogen atom. So there's, it is the smallest amino acid and so it fits very well within that helix and allows the polypeptide chains to associate into this tight conformation and no other residue would work. A really good example of how that primary structure, that is which residues are present in which position, drives the association of even the quaternary structure. The triple helix is further stabilized by hydrogen bonds. The peptide binds of the glycine residues are able to hydrogen bond between helices. So the carbonyl group of glycine in one chain with the amine group of the peptide bond in adjacent chain. The peptide bonds of the other residues can't hydrogen bond together because of the geometry of the arrangement, but they do interact with water. There are also hydrogen bonds between the side chains of those hydroxyproline residues. Remember we've got that OH group on there. Collagen also forms more complex structures, but remember what we want to do is assemble these outside the cell. Of course it's a protein so it's synthesized within the cell, but then we need to transport it outside the cell or secrete it in order to form these complex uh, structures. So there are proteases that trim them. Proteases are simply enzymes that digest protein. And so we're going to trim these collagen molecules. We're going to line them side to side and end to end to form these large fibers. You can think of it as if we took planks of wood and cut them up into different pieces and aligned them up from side to side and end to end to form a large framework. The structure is further stabilized by very strong cross links and it's a special kind of cross link. We're going to take a lysine side chain and that's pictured here we're going to oxidize that to a carbonyl and then those oxidized lysine side chains of adjacent chains can form a very strong covalent bond. So what we get is a very intricate, very complex structure outside the cell that contributes to the glue that holds us together. That concludes our studies of the structural proteins in Chapter 5. Next we want to look at motor proteins and we'll look first at myosin. We want to see its mode of action and what its role is in biological systems.